Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is uh, Omar Hussain, I'm the Religious Director at MCETC. So welcome to my candidates. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. Who is here in the Masjid or Mosque for the first time? Uh, you are, sir. Could you stand up for a second? Yeah. You're here for the first time? Yeah. Look at me. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, the reason we're here doesn't really matter what our faith is, we're a very diverse community. We're here as concerned San Antonians in general. And so that is why uh, we do a lot of outreach programs, but this is all about the city. So we want to get this uh, mindset out that people are not welcome, or people are different, or whatever. And so that is why we are hosting this event tonight. So I'm going to pass it off now to Sakhar Shay uh, for the CMC for the event. So, uh, for anybody who is not familiar with me, I'm a board member here. Uh, I serve on the Public Relations Committee and the Public Outreach Committee. Uh, we started an entity with the message called SA Muslim Vote. <coughs> if you have any problems with you, I encourage you to go to the website SA Muslim Vote or look for us on Facebook and sign up with us. Whether you're Muslim or not, it's just a way for us to be educated about the issues that affect us, that particularly the Muslim Masjid are all throughout San So. For the candidates, before we, before I give you guys the opening statements, I'll just tell you the it's going to be very general terms. Everybody will have two minutes to answer a question. You don't have to take all two minutes. Uh, I will. So this will be something different. I will allow you guys once everyone has given an answer to, if you want, ask each other a question. If you want to challenge someone, just, just raise your hand. Before I move on to the next question, I'll call on you. Uh, your response will be one minute. And I reserve the right myself. If an answer is given that needs some clarification, I'll ask you, and that response will be one minute as well. Uh, I'm not going to pick on anyone. If there's just any clarification that I can communicate with that come from an answer, I'll, I'll ask for the clarification. Uh, if you see my good friend here in the red shirt, he's going to be our timekeeper. So at two minutes, he's going to go. That's right. At 30, so there's 30 seconds left. He's going to go like this. Okay. When you're out of time, he's going to go like this. So you guys know. Oh, there we go. He, he's going to do That's more. So, and what we're going to do, Pat, I'm going to start with you. And then as we, we're going to move to my left. And whoever's next is going to answer the first question. Uh, you know, and then we'll, we'll keep moving in that direction. So, uh, let's start with some introductions. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting us tonight. I'm very honored to be here today. My name is Pat Stamp, and I have lived in this district for 14 years. I have had my business for 12 years, and I'm going to be here today. My business is a uh, travel agency. I have had my business for 35 years, um, and I have been in this district, like I said, for 14 years. Thank you for some. This is my phone. A little closer to you guys. Like this? Is this better? Yes. Thank you. Should I start now? Go ahead. Let's start. Let's start fresh. You tell me. My name is Pat Stout. I'm a business owner here in San Antonio. I have owned my business for 35 years. I have two daughters, grown up daughters, two grandchildren. <laughs> and uh, I have lived in the district for uh, 14 years, going to 15. And also, I have had my business for 12 years while I was back home. I have decided to, to run for District A because I have the experience, I have the knowledge about business, I have been very successful in my business, and I have been working for community all this time at the same time. Since 1990, I have been involved with Chambers of Commerce, being uh, the uh, chair of the Hispanic Chamber in 2014. I've been the president of the National Association of Women Business Owners. Uh, chapter San Antonio. I've been the president and national treasurer for the Mexican Association of Entrepreneurs. So, my forte is not only business but accounting, finance, and uh, this is something that has helped grow my business and become very successful. I was um, featured in Forbes magazine last summer in June as a woman who <coughs> started from scratch with no assistance, no help, and develop my business through very, very difficult times. So I'm very proud of that, but at the same time, 
I want to put all of that experience to work. I love District 10, and we have many problems uh, in District 10. One of the most important problems that we are dealing, and I have seen it develop and become more difficult, is the traffic. So, and I think that we all agree that something needs to be done. As simple as just calibrating the traffic lights would be the first thing that we need to do so that we have a more fluid traffic. We have other ideas that uh, you know, I have uh, talked about with Via, and I think that there's many possibilities of making the traffic much better. Thank you. Let's, let's, uh, that's time. Let's see. Well, let's, let's, I mean, just to, uh, we can have time for everybody. Uh, one thing I want to mention, we have a microphone here for the audience if you want to ask a question. I just ask that you just let us get into two or three questions before anybody stands up. Cindy? As me, Cynthia. My background is in marketing and advertising, and I did that for 30 years. I traveled around the country for AT&T, uh, selling their internet advertising, and also uh, public advertising. I also have a master's degree from St. Mary's University here in San Antonio in public administration. And I also have two minors, one in urban planning and development, and the other one is in public affairs. I am a military family member. My husband is currently deployed. He is in Afghanistan, and he's been there for five and a half years. The summer will be six years. As for me, I gave up my career, retired, to serve alongside my husband. As he served in the military, when the Army found out what my background was in, they immediately put me to work. And one of my hallmarks in my life is I established the Band of Angels, which was a, a, a nonprofit organization that helped support the members that were staying at the Fisher House. And the Fisher House, if you're not familiar with it, it is like the Ronald McDonald House for the public. And so we did that at Fort Hood, and then, what does this mean? 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, and so they replicated it here in San Antonio, and it is Soldier's Angels. And the reason that I got into politics is because I'm a very strong woman, and I believe that we need transparency in our local government, and we need the people's voice to be heard. And so I put my name out, and I want to take all my experience and put it to work for you in District 8. Thank you. Paul? Sorry, I, I apparently uh, we neglected my, myself and my staff neglected to uh, actually uh, respond to the invitation. This I thought we had. So uh, well, I appreciate the fact that you guys were ready with the uh, pandemic. Uh, a mini plate. Uh, but again, my name is Paul Martin. Uh, I uh, have had an interest in, in serving uh, for a number of years in politics. Uh, I currently serve on a number of boards in, in the city and elsewhere and commissions. Uh, in fact, I found out when I filed on 16 boards and commissions, uh, which uh, part of my plan is that if I'm elected, then I'll have to obviously have to reduce uh, some of that service to be able to serve the city effectively. Uh, the reason I'm running is uh, I think that in addition to wanting to serve is that I, uh, I think that I do have the capability to help make some good decisions. Uh, we're a growing city and uh, there are a lot of challenges out there and I think that I can help to uh, make some, some good decisions in the future. Uh, my background is, I have uh, a very background actually. Currently I have an investment management firm called Martin Capital Advisors which I started in 1989. So I'm also a self-made businessman and uh, it's been a successful business uh, for all these years. Um, in addition to that, I have uh, been involved in uh, startups and uh, startup technologies and uh, started a fund called Transformative Technologies Fund, for which I'm a general partner, and have invented a few technologies as well, but I'm currently working on part time, of course. Uh, I'm also an artist and uh, do that uh, instead of playing golf, I like to get in my studio and paint. Uh, and I think uh, that pretty much covers my background. I, I should also mention, I guess, well, uh, 
uh, very important thing, which I almost uh, forgot to, to bring up. I also served in the military. I served uh, three years in the Army and a total of 17 in the Navy, between four years active duty and 13 uh, in the Navy Reserve, and I retired as a commander. Uh, so I hope you'll consider uh, voting for me uh, for District 8, and if you have any questions, look forward to uh, visiting with you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And good evening, my name is Manny Palaya, Sassalamu I am uh, I'm a father of a little boy and a little girl. I'm a husband of a public school teacher. Her name is Diana. I'm the son of my parents, who are here in front of all of us this, uh, this evening, uh, Martha Panais and Dr. Panais. And I have dedicated myself as a lawyer uh, to this community, uh, this community of small business owners, this community of entrepreneurs, this community of homeowners. I represent hundreds of them, and a lot of homeowners associations, and I represent a lot of companies who come to San Antonio to do business in San Antonio. But I'm not doing that. I've served for many years now, more than I can count, uh, as the uh, General Counsel for the Bad Women and Children's Shelter. And uh, if, if some of you may know, but it's a shelter that works closely on the refugee issue and uh, it has a lot of experience working with the city, the state, uh, and the federal government on uh, issues that are uh, centered around families and making sure that the families in San Antonio have the resources they need and that they can thrive. Uh, I'm not doing that, I'm also volunteering for our city. Uh, I've served as a board member for VIA, uh, for the Metropolitan, uh, the MPO Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Advanced Transportation District, where we actually did real work on, uh, on traffic solutions and uh, public transit. I've also been the chairman of the Brook City Base, where we did real work uh, and had a lot of success with infrastructure projects, development projects, park projects, sidewalks and streets. And lastly, I've been the chair of the uh, Bond Committee for Drainage under Phil Harper, where I also got to have a lot of real hands-on experience. And so I'm here to ask for your vote tonight. And thank you all for uh, inviting us out here. And it's, uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, man. Tell me. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for first for having us out here putting to get this uh, uh, forum together. It's, uh, it's really great to see people involved. My name is Tony Bonini, I'm a candidate for District 8. And a lot of people ask, Tony, why are you running? And that goes back to something I learned in high school. Uh, I was a small guy in, in high school, and that made me an easy target to be picked on the bully. And yes, I was even that kid that was thrown in a locker. I know, that's embarrassing. But one day I learned to stand up for myself. And in that moment, I discovered a few things. First, that I had a voice. And second, that I was much stronger than anybody gave me credit for, including myself. And it's that strength today that allows me to use my voice to share my story with you, even the embarrassing parts about being thrown in the locker. As time went on, I saw that same group of boys, all they did was move on to the next kid. And that's when I learned my third and most valuable lesson, that it wasn't enough just to stand up for myself, but I had to stand up for others that had discovered that strength in themselves. And that is what we should expect out of our city councilors. So many who was willing to listen to us, to, to right wrongs, and to stand up for us. And that's what I want to bring to, to City Council. It is also why I'm fortunate enough to work for an organization that, that serves our military uh, families and, uh, and our veterans. Because their mission is serving those who have served us speaks to my mission. It's also why, before I was running, I was already serving District 8 as Special Projects Coordinator, helping out our, our current councilman, Ron Herber, and our district manager, Ray Garza. So once again, I want to thank you for having me out. I look forward to answering all your questions, and I congratulate you by taking action on being here. I'm going to challenge you to take one more action, though. Please go to my website, vote20b.com, and on the How to Get Involved page, I have what I call the Be the Change Challenge. I'm going to ask you to do one of three, three, one of three things. If you like my message, please donate $25 so I can get my message out. Second, come out, volunteer, help spread my message. And the third final one, Go out and find a nonprofit here in San Antonio and volunteer your time, whether that's the San Antonio Food Bank or Habitat for uh, Habitat. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So, so we'll start with that first question. For anyone that has to drive on I-10 from Ralph Bear Road to 410 and anywhere within a 10 mile radius from there, you know that I have traffic coming. And given that the population is expected to grow by 1.1 million people over the next 20 years, how do you address the issue of traffic congestion 
And what specific solutions will you provide given the expanding population? As I mentioned before, when I was introducing myself, the first thing we need to do is we need one of calibrating the, the traffic lights. And I have made a couple of calls, and I do a worse back, you know, with military, so we have about the same issues. And it makes a big difference. Uh, I didn't just think about that, but I, I took action. And I called, and um, it makes a big, big difference. And they are taking your calls now. When you're in a situation like that, you can call them and tell them what you are experiencing in traffic. And we, we noticed that it was a big difference. I talked to somebody else. Uh, who manages the, the lights and they, they told us that they are getting calls from citizens uh, and they are trying to work that in. That, that's some, something that we need to do immediately. There should be other uh, issues that we can work together with Visa. I was uh, attending a meeting at uh, the park, at the Harbinger Park. We had the opportunity of sitting, sitting at a table with a map by the streets, different citizens, and we address the issues on every street. The citizens sat at the table with the VIA employees and explained exactly what's happening at each street and at what times of the day. Notes were taken, we're going to get a transcript of what's happening, and then we're going to start communicating together to see what we can do about these problems and about all the different accidents that happen in the world. Thank you. Cynthia? What I'm going to do is I'm going to implement a city ordinance for all trucks, trailers, fifth wheels, RVs, and buses, white lane only. How many of us have, have traveled around the country, even as far as I-35, Lincoln, Broncos, and we'll see all trucks, white lane only. We need to do that here in the city of San Antonio so that they can get out of our way so that we can pass them. People are constantly cutting in front of them, they're slowing us down, they need to be the right lane. The second thing that I would do is they have been doing this since 1995 in London, England. And that is, they have been using seven-foot black cars to surround an accident. Every time someone's changing a tire or if there's an accident, uh, people are always stopping and looking. And so these black cars that they use in England surround the scene of an accident and it reduces rubber necking. There's nothing to see, and traffic moves right on. So those are two things that I would do as your councilwoman in District A. Those two ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Let's let's try to keep the applause for a minute, just because it uses time. I uh, think there are a lot of things we can do, of course, uh, to fix some of the short-term issues and. Believe me, if you think traffic is bad today, just imagine how bad it's going to be in the future if we don't really start climbing ahead. So uh, I agree that there are a number of things that could be done immediately. However, my biggest concern is uh, addressing your question for into the future. Uh, how are we going to manage the growth and the traffic that comes with that? And that's a big challenge, and it's one that I'm very interested in working on. I don't have any solutions this evening for that. But uh, it, it is uh, an interest of mine, and as we're sitting here, even as participating in these events, I've had these ideas going through my head, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, being able to pursue them and seeing what we can do so that uh, 10, 20 years, 10, 20 years from now, uh, we uh, hopefully uh, the traffic will be better than it is today and not worse. Thank you, man. Um, there's nobody in San Antonio who thinks that our traffic is good. We're getting better. Uh, in fact, it, it used to be the joke that, my gosh, at least we're not in Austin. And I recently heard somebody from Austin say, well, at least we're not in San Antonio. Right? Our traffic is getting worse. And we continue to grow. As we grow, it's going to continue to get worse. Our streets are going to continue to get older. And it's not going to get any cheaper to fix them. Uh, in fact, it's getting more expensive to fix streets. One thing that we know, just from having been in traffic, all of us together, is that we sit there wondering, tell, tell me if I'm right, we sit there wondering, why am I here when I should be spending my time with my kids and my loved ones and doing something else? Imagine the number of hours we lose every single year seeing traffic. So, this is a job interview, by the way. We're all sitting here asking you for a job. And for a job interview, what, I, what I'm going to point out is that it's really important to know what you're talking about and have actual experience and expertise doing this. And so, I'm actually representing clients and I work with other cities today 
on traffic solutions in particular, the one thing we're seeing is when you left behind is on the tech side. We're really good at laying asphalt and pouring concrete. We're not very good it's not even, uh, doing the uh, necessary work as far as uh, getting light synchronicity and intelligent traffic system. I, I, I hate contradicting my friend Pat, but there is no such thing as traffic light calibration. It doesn't exist. It, the word is synchronization and intelligent traffic systems. In San Antonio, all of our lights are set on egg timers, pretty much. Those are sequence lights. We don't do what we need to do to get it right like other cities where I've been working actually for those solutions. Thank you, Tom? So thank you for the question. I think uh, it's really a two-part answer to this. Is first, we have to look at strategical uh, options and then tactical. On the strategic side, what we need to do is really talk about city planning. One of the issues we have a lot is we have uh, some of these smaller roads lead into a piece of land that's zoned for single-family residents. And then later on, we go back in and then rezone that so an apartment complex can be built on there. But there's no thought able to wait. These streets were not uh, designed or built to accommodate that kind of traffic. So we need to start having those kind of conversations ahead of time and start thinking about how we can uh, grow smarter. And that's going to be done uh, through the planning. On, this, on the tactical side, that's where we can get into to utilize the technology, looking at how we can better uh, refine uh, our mass transit around uh, you know, via uh, rapid bus systems, uh, things along those lines, uh, around having uh, you know, smart uh, stoplights, so we can, we can manage that down to the tactical level. So I think there's, there's a number of strategies, but we have to include both where we look at the, the, the long term planning and then the, the short term tactics that we can use to help alleviate traffic. And there's, there's a number of those. Thank you. Yes, uh, um, when we, I didn't make this up. Um, that was something that we discussed here in the VIA uh, meeting. You know, we're kind of getting the lots, and that's something that I learned there and that I also experienced. I just wanted to make that clear. Did, did you have a question for me? No, I okay. just wanted to talk about that. One of the things that they came to calibrate me is they can also display the speed limit at which you want the traffic to flow so that people aren't doing 70 miles an hour, especially if there's an accident ahead. Maybe the traffic needs to be dropped down to 45. So by calibrating the traffic flow, you can control the traffic flow so that it doesn't bother them. I think that's what she meant. Sure, okay, so let's um, let you respond, but let's, uh, so these follow-ups are meant to ask another candidate question. So, many sure have a question. Sure. Sure. So, I, I work all over the country on traffic issues, specifically on traffic signaling. What you both are talking about is 20 year old technology that already exists in Juarez, Mexico. What I'm talking about is stuff that we have not implemented and yet other first world class cities have. Putting your lights on an egg timer is not what the world class city is. Putting your lights on a real time machine learning that reacts real time to traffic conditions. So that, let's say, there's a traffic jam, and on top of that, the spurs are letting out, and on top of that, the rodeo is letting out at the exact same time. Your traffic lights on the north side need to react real time in anticipation. That's what everybody knows, and we don't do. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Cynthia, we're going to start with you. As residents of the city, growing families, clean and safe parks are a major priority for us. What will you do to increase park visitation and ensure further development of new parks? I'm sorry, what was the last part? So, what will you do to increase park visitation and ensure further development of new parks? And to ensure further development of other parks? Right. I think that having parks is a critical component of having well being in our city. We have to have a way to get out to exercise, and I think that it's important that. We provide uh, bike lanes. I believe that we have to have hiking trails and uh, walking paths so that people can get out and get the necessary exercise that they need. And so I think that also water fountains are important and handicap parking. I know that Frederick's, uh, per, Frederick's Park, I'll just get confused with the street, but it's Frederick's Park, which is off I 10 and Bernie Strange Road where I live, they lack the proper handicap parking to, uh, for all the residents, and also they lack water fountains. And so I would uh, make sure that we have the proper funding so that people want to go utilize those. Because as it is, it's difficult when 
for example, I had a doctor who couldn't even get, he was a paraplegic, he couldn't even get to Frederick's uh, Park at all because there was no handicap parking, he had to park a quarter mile away. And so it's very difficult for someone like that. So I would make sure that we got the funding to provide uh, the amenities and uh, make sure that everyone is accommodated. Thank you. Paul? And because there's so much time, to continue to repeat the question. Okay, I, I, I think I still remember what it was now. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, parks are very important in the community, uh, and I think obviously it's something that we need to work hard to preserve. And I'm tying in with the, the idea of the fact that this is a very fast growing city. I think that means that we have to be more aggressive in preserving park life in the city. Uh, and, uh, and, and also, as we develop parks, to obviously make them easy access into them and out of them and have the facilities that people want in parks. I think it's kind of like people are dreams. If you build the right park, people will come. And uh, so I, I think that the city's done a pretty good job on that uh, regard, but obviously we always do a lot better. Uh, my main concern is making sure that we have uh, park land available well into the future as well. Thank you. And San Antonio is one of the most rich cities in Texas with regards to parks. Uh, they're beautiful. They're a jewel. If you haven't gone to a, a park lately, I encourage you to go. I don't encourage you just to go to the parks in District 8, though. There's parks on the south side of the Medina River Park, which is an absolute paradise if you love birds and wildflowers. I mention that because um, I added 600 acres to the Medina Park myself. It's a project that I got to lead and uh, do the survey on walking in and actually laying out those plans and leaving a park for generations to come. I also land, uh, did a $3.2 million park on the south side uh, on Brook City Base, which is beautiful and stunning if it connects down to the river. I'm pointing this out because I'm the only person at this table who's actually done parks, but more importantly, who knows about parks because, um, and who knows what it takes to build one, fund one, and actually preserve one. So I have a uh, very special place in my heart. I, will, I take my children to parks all the time, all the time. And um, I take my children to parks all over the country. Uh, and great cities have great parks, and so I'll tell you, our inventory of parks here in San Antonio is very rich, and all we need to do is make sure we have leadership on council to maintain those parks, but more importantly, keep them clean and keep them safe, right? That's what we want the most from our parks. And so, uh, with that, I do encourage you to go to the city's website. There's all the listing of parks and all the different activities that are free to you and your family, uh, and enjoy them. Thank you. Uh, Tony? So, uh, I too am a father. I have a three and a half year old little girl and a two year old, and I know we love uh, going out to the parks and enjoying nature. Uh, but I also have another reason why I love parks. Uh, you know, I never thought of myself as a long distance trucker, but a few years back, I just got this crazy idea let me try to run a marathon. And so I started training and running, and I tell you what, nothing will, will give you greater appreciation for the green spaces we have than when you're going out on 20 mile runs. And uh, so, one thing I'd like to do is, is, is continue to protect the parks we have and make sure to try to connect as many of these parks together as we can. And, and also see about building uh, you know, bike lanes that lead into these parks that are more accessible for people who are uh, you know, cyclists, uh, triathlon uh, uh, marathoners, as well as families who enjoy uh, using the, the green spaces. So I think it's important to protect and then also to continue to grow those green spaces because they are valuable. Thank you, Pat. 14 years ago, when I moved to District Day, um, the house that I live now. They started the park, um, and I was so lucky that my home has a door like there to go to the park. The park. Before that, we had to travel to park because my grandchildren needed to, you know, have fun and run, etc. And then all of a sudden, magic happened. This park was developed right next to my, you know, home. And we were so lucky that we saw how he was developed. They kept it natural, we had beer, we had a little stream somewhere that all over the place. We have all kinds of trees, all trees, new trees. You can see people running, you can see mothers with their carriages driving around their kids, the, the dog park, etc. I am a hundred percent for all parks because not only does parks make your life and your family's life better makes you healthier, it gives you peace of mind, 
And I would like to see more parties like the Park Ranger Park that I am so lucky to have on this tour. Today, that park, the other day, I, 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 I relate to the park, so I'm there constantly. But now that it's gone and it's just kept like a jewel, this, this is the example of more parks like that in, in, in every way in San Antonio because this is for our children, this is for our family, I'm a grandmother. And for me, there's nothing better than to see my grandkids enjoying the park. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I'm going to start with you on this one. When we look at the various characteristics of the city and the differences between each of the districts, we see that every district has its own distinct design and form of beauty, whether it's the Stone Oak area, Alamo Ranch, South Town, and downtown for long term. What is your plan for beautification of our district? Oh, I, I can't say oh, I, I have a plan for beautification. Uh, man, I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is obviously uh, important in any city that the, the city be attracted to its residents and uh, that it, it has a, an impact on the uh, morale of the city, I think. Uh, the more beautiful the city is, uh, the nicer uh, things are set up. Um, so, it, uh, you know, I, I think that one of the things that, uh, like I said, this bond uh, issue uh, is going to be voted on is uh, as to the arts and uh, supporting public art, which is something that uh, is, has been somewhat controversial. Uh, some people think that we don't need public art. I personally think that uh, there is a place for public art. The challenges in how you uh, select it and, and improve it, and place it appropriately. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I would uh, definitely want to spend my time on the council thinking about ways that we can enhance the city and beautify it and uh, make it more attractive. Thank you. And San Antonio is rich in uh, vegetation. But more importantly, San Antonio is rich in its homeowners and uh, the people in San Antonio. So I'll, I'll give you an example of something we don't do. We do not incentivize homeowners to beautify more than their houses already are, right? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if SAWs actually gave you a rebate for not only installing plants that are gravel resistant, but installing trees and plants that are beautiful and drive the system, right? And the other thing we don't do very well is continuity of development standards for entire areas of town. Development standards exist in small pockets, so if you go up and down the, uh, let's say, uh, the new, uh, you know, the new neighborhoods on the west side, you'll see that you know stores have limits on signs. You see that stores are limited to having the same kind of building materials for fascia and all that. We don't do that citywide. Other cities have figured out how to do that. It's called the Unified Development Code. Uh, and those cities have had huge successes in making sure that their cities are aesthetically beautiful. Right? After all, people write songs about beautiful cities. Um, they don't write songs about cities like Plano, where you don't have any of those things happening. And so, um, I, uh, the most important thing I would do is I would, I would convene you, all of you in this room, and all of your neighbors, and ask you what you think is beautiful. That's the problem with beautification efforts at the city level is that too often we leave it up to just a few elected officials and an architect who's got a contract with the city to decide what's beautiful for you. We rarely have ever come against you. Thank you, Mayor Tony. So, you mentioned that San Antonio has an amazing diversity of locations for work. You know, the, the downtown area is thriving, you know, it's uh, coming up, you know, it's a lot of the south town. We have the tourist areas where we have uh, out of town relatives and families come visit you. And uh, so there's something here for everybody. And one thing I want to make sure that we do is that we don't try to make San Antonio the next, you know, Dallas or the next Houston or the next Austin. What we want to do is make sure San Antonio is the best version of San Antonio it can be. And we do that by reaching out to people, by having those conversations, by talking about uh, one of the examples I was giving earlier about zoning. Why do we make it so hard for people, citizens, to, to be involved in those conversations? Uh, there's a lot of barriers that are put up between us and our government. Personally, I don't believe our, our city government should be a group of people who arbitrarily decide how the rest of us should live. We should be a platform that allows us as citizens to come together to create our own solutions. So when it comes to beautification, yes, we need to sit down and have these conversations. And this is where I believe we can utilize technology to have these conversations. Look up how active people are becoming on uh, apps like Facebook and Nextdoor and talk about what's going on in the community. Why hasn't our city government tapped into that same technology to help drive these conversations and get people involved when we do have uh, pieces of land that are up for, for zoning? Thank you. Uh, I would like to see more natural trails and the love for, for the city and, and 
do the block fire for the pieces of land that they you know, observe the parts. It creates an uh, art that we can buy art in nature. In that we buy also uh, areas where we can exercise uh, you know, for the purpose of being held here. Area where the families can be you know, gathered. Uh, I remember when I came to Santa Fe in 1974, people were going to have picnics that day as a day like this tomorrow. We would like to see more places where families can enjoy, you know, family dinner outside. And I would be very, very interested in having more green areas that the natural trace and combining art that I have been doing every moment before. And we need to have that in hopefully even concerts. I think that that would be something that the families in these two places will enjoy and we could attract from the neighbors. Thank you. Cynthia. I love this question. Let me tell you what I would do. I would plant trees. Trees to provide shade, trees to provide color, so that it would beautify the area. That's the number one thing you can do to increase the value of your home, is to add trees. But since we're a tourist destination, having these beautiful colors, like the crepe myrtle, the Texas red bud, uh, possum how, these kinds of trees that are drought resistant. I would also uh, cut down the grass, make sure that the, uh, the grass along the freeway is mowed. I would make sure that empty lots aren't let to grow tall because when you do that, then you have mosquito infestation and then you have roads coming in. And so we have to keep that down. I also clean up the roads. Pick up the debris along the side of the freeways to make it nice and presentable. And then um, doing all these things collectively uh, and adding more lighting to reduce the crime. Uh, those are some of the things that I would do to beautify District 8. Thank you. Uh, so, and I'm going to start with you on this one. It's very similar to the previous question. Uh, District 8 is almost never associated with anything artistic or culture. Why is that? And would you like to see more cultural events happening in the district as opposed to always in downtown? So for example, close to downtown, we have the Cellar Theater and the Center Comedy Club and various festivals that Yeah. Um, I have a. I, I hate to disagree with you too, but I'm going to push back on you a little bit. Um, we, we do have quite a rich offering of uh, cultural events at UTSA, right? Um, and for those of you that don't, um, no, UTSA offers concerts every weekend and plays. They're open to the public, and so I would encourage you. They're beautiful places to take your children. We do it quite often, but that's where it begins and ends. Um, and uh, I know that you and you know your community have a festival here that you throw for them, uh, you know, and there's food and music. And but again, that's where it begins and ends. And so, you know, one thing I'll tell you is that what we don't do is host uh, community-wide get-togethers. You know, they do that in Frankfurt every single weekend. For those of you that haven't been to Frankfurt, Germany, every single weekend, one entire block gets together and throws a party for their neighborhoods just because. We don't do that, right? That's culture. Being with each other is culture, right? They all go out, they play music, and they cook for each other. Um, we don't have a walkable city, so I would start there. Downtown attracts all those events, and downtown attracts those festivals because there's a place to hold those. Up here, there hasn't necessarily been an outcry from them. The uh, citizens to host them locally. And so, you know, we do have streets that are beautiful streets over here, right? And that can be used for local festivals and nobody asks. And so, I don't think it's necessarily on the city, but any citizen can apply for a permit to have a festival uh, of their, you know, and even if it's just if it's, if it's uh, just because festival, I encourage you to do that. Those are fun. Uh, music, food, who doesn't like that? Thank you. Tell me. So one is, uh, I think what we can do is have the, our city councilman lead, lead by example. And when so when Manny talks about getting together with the neighbors, that's actually something I've already done. Uh, I have a neighbor here who, who's, who's been to one of these events where I, I, I use technology next door to advertise. You know what? This is not a political event. We're just going to get together to get to know each other as neighbors. We did that a few months ago. We encouraged other people, you know what? Let's go out and have walk parties. And we had a number of people who attended that event who said, you know what? Uh, you know. Three weeks after that event, I went out and passed out flowers to people on my street, and we had a little barbecue in our front yard, and I cooked up hot dogs, people came down, and we got to meet who our neighbors are. So that's important. It's important to lead by example to do those things. 
And I think it, it is a shame that we don't utilize UTSA more. We have so many young people here that would love to have these type of events that we would, that would attend. And I think this is where, as a city councilman, that I would have the ability to, to speak up and, and to advocate for, for having more events here and getting people more involved. So uh, yes, we do need to do more. And it's all about leading by example and starting uh, with each other and our neighbors. Because when we look to the person on the left of us and the person on the right of us, get to know each other and, and say, you know what, I've got your back, that's how we start tackling the big problems that the city faces around traffic, around safety, around crime, and around poverty. I think it's important. Well, I have been made many, many festivals all these years, and I can't because I've been walking my grandchildren in school, don't make them away from their areas. But I'm not telling you what. If you just start going to the festivals in the different churches, they have spring and summer, and they bring a lot of amazing things in the theater, etc. We have a church that has, as soon as the summer begins, they have a movie theater outside, and they have a big spring, people bring the picnics and the baskets. So there's a lot of that, and I, I've been very lucky that I've been participating in my community all these, these years, for 14 years, and I see that it develops more and more. In my community, uh, 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 and in Summerfield, we have these gatherings like uh, once or twice a month. Um, I have attended several homeowners associations events. There's one that impressed me so much, it's Shenandoah, that uh, attend. Uh, I attend their breakfast once a month. They have incredible meetings and dinners. And I know all the neighbors now. It's like I walk in and I live there. They told me you should move to this neighborhood because there's something happening. I know the children, they are running around, people are swimming. So we just need to get closer to our neighborhoods, to our churches, because we will make new friends, we will be enjoying the ambitious we see, we see, and we will, you know, have you know that that personal touch with the different communities. Thank you. Same. I agree with Tony and Karen Cat. Uh, as a military family member, we always said home is where you are your neighbors. And what we would do for the holidays is we would always get together for these Christmas, whether it was New Year's, or if it was just the summertime, we would just get together and we'd have a big old uh, picnic in the parking lot and we would fellowship with each other. And so that's how we got to know you know, different people from around the world, and that's how we got to know our neighbors that were living next door. And the other thing that uh, I got that, uh, Pat said was the churches. We have some really, really large churches here in District 8, and a lot of times they have fellowships. So why couldn't we do uh, one month, it'd be at one church, the next month be at another church, and just kind of rotate around that way all of us could get together and get to know each other and you know become one big family. Something like that. That's what I would do. Thank you. Paul. Well, I think there have been a, a lot of good ideas that have been mentioned just now. I do think it's important for the city to facilitate activities in all of the communities and districts of the city. And uh, that's something that I don't think is going to happen other than really in the downtown area. And I, I certainly would have an interest in, in working to improve access to events in this area. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you all have events uh, periodically during the year that you may want to invite people. Uh, and I would certainly uh, be interested in helping to facilitate and getting the word out uh, to invite your friends and neighbors uh, to come to events here. And in addition to that, I think that there are a lot of uh, facilities already in place, such as uh, some of the shopping areas and what have you, where there could be events. Uh, in fact, I, I started the process of working on an event a few years ago to have an art event at La Contera. And we'll probably still do it one day, but it's kind of on the back burner for right now. Um, so I am, I am very interested in looking at opportunities uh, to have uh, different events and activities here, in addition to facilitating uh, maybe universities opening up uh, when they have a, a play, for instance, letting the community know about it, that type of thing. And UTSA uh, also has many art events as well that I think they could do a better job of letting the community know about. It. So I, I would uh, certainly want to work with with, uh, with everyone in the district uh, insofar as people have ideas for activities and events and uh, help get the word out. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to 
ask a question about job. Is, is there anyone in the audience that wants to ask a question? Okay, okay so if you have a question, go ahead and come up to the mic. Go ahead. My name is uh, Ahmed Hassan. I work uh, for the federal government. First of all, before I, have, I have two questions. Before I ask, it's wonderful to see all four candidates for city council very friendly, very nice, you know, uh, debate going on. So I appreciate you, you, you know, going for city council. The two questions I have is we are recently involved in construction um, and having all these things going on in, on our campus. And personally, I'm also involved in um, some of the construction. The bureaucracy in the city is so terrible. You know, just getting the zoning approved can take more than a year or two years. Getting this water permits, electrical permits, it just takes forever. So I would like to know like, what you can do to improve for, for builders or developers to, you know, to, to, to keep the city growing. Uh, the second question I have is I live right on my tenant, I live on Bernie Street Road, and there's terrible construction going on for more than three years now. And here in San Francisco, the border gate bridge was built in three years. So I would like to know when the construction gets started, what can you do to expedite, you know, the completion of the project so we won't get affected for the time? Let's let's start with some these these are the two minute answers. Uh, so first when it comes to cutting through the red tape, uh, I think that's where my job experience will, will help with that. Uh, one of the things I do is I work as a, a, a product manager. And a lot of what I do is, is come up with, with a documenting systems and procedures and looking for how to identify those so we can identify risk and opportunity to streamline it and eliminate single points of failure. So I think I can bring that skill set into City Hall and review how is our current zoning process working and work, work with our, our, our city managers and their staff to, to identify points and you know, have them report to them what kind of progress we're, we're making on, on streamlining. Uh, I know one of the other issues we have is sometimes construction happens, it is a, it is a nightmare, uh, but uh, we also have to be careful because uh, certain parts of roads, like if it's I-10 construction, that's going to be your, your state and federal that's in charge of that. Uh, sometimes when there's uh, construction around uh, like flood zones, that's going to be the county that takes care of that. So when it comes to, to city level streets, that's where the city is involved and that's where we can directly impact. So once again, I think I would bring my skill set to bear. Um, what can we do to help uh, help streamline and facilitate, and in the process, hopefully uh, achieve some cost reductions because maybe we won't be spinning our wheels as much. Thank you, Pat. I had the opportunity of talking to um, a lady that represents District 8 in the zoning uh, department. Uh, she's on the, on the board, and she explained to me the process. And what I really think that needs to be done is updated. Know, and, and make it more not transparent, but right? make it more uh, simple so that you can get your permits. I, I purchased three buildings right on the side road, and I understand your pain because I have great difficulty changing the zoning. And you took me about seven months on one, a year in another one, and that's something that I will be paying a lot of attention because I hear the complaints that we're ready to start construction, you to purchase that piece of land or that building and then they stop it because you know you cannot get the permits. So I went through the process three times, three times. And I know what, what happens and I've been talking to the people that represent District A that is working there. And so I have I, I think we need to update the process and so I'm gonna work with that. On the um, I think for your I just, I just go through there and I see that it's happening everywhere. I will immediately, if I get elected, I will uh, get to work on all, not only that project, there's many different projects that have been, I don't know, I cannot say it's so, but they have been on permanent construction for uh, several years or months, so that is something that we need to advocate, whether it is the, the Texas Department of Transportation or SRC. So I will get to work as soon as possible. So one of the things, Cynthia, I'll let you answer. But one of the things that you're looking for is, uh, in an answer, is for you to use your experience and tell me how that would provide a solution and what, what a potential solution would be. So I'll, I'll just ask you, I'll come, I'll come back to you. So let's take the end of the answer and I'll give you another chance to provide a specific solution. Go ahead, Cynthia. What I would do is I would ask the city to change the way the contracts are set up 
to replicate what they do with construction. A third, a third, and a third. You don't get any money up front. After a third of the project is completed, then you get a third. When you complete two thirds of the project, you get two thirds. If you complete the project under the designated time and under budget, you get a bonus. If you go over, then you get penalized. So that's what I use a third of their return. That's what they do in construction. This is construction, so it's quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Well, anytime you start talking about development and construction projects, uh, it definitely uh, can become a challenge sometimes. I, I think the key for me is that I would always have my door open for anyone who's having problems, legitimate problems, uh, or at least they believe in legitimate problems, and try to work through them with them. And, uh, and in my position on the council, uh, try to use my influence if I do see a situation where uh, things are not being handled properly to try to get the back on the right track. Uh, I think it's also the case that, that uh, we may need more staff as well to uh, uh, review projects and, uh, and figure out how to make them happen. Uh, so that's something that I would look into as well. And then uh, regarding the issues of I-10 uh, in particular, uh, that is always a challenge, you know, working with the state and uh, uh, other the county and so on. So, uh, uh, but again, uh, as I'm aware of issues, and I would certainly uh, want to delve into them and uh, try to come up with solutions. I have to say that uh, regarding the situation there, uh, I can, uh, nearly all the springs, uh, I don't know the particulars on that at this point, but I would be happy to look into it. Uh, so this is if I would like it on day one. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh the first question you asked me about, you know, how painful and slow it is for zoning, I'm going to give you a sad answer uh, at the beginning, but I think there's a solution for that. The second one, uh, there is a solution. I, uh, I get, I, my clients pay me to help them push the zoning through. Okay? So I, I work for uh, churches and schools and homeowners associations and then, you know, other people, uh, you know, who have small businesses who need zoning exchange. Um, and because I'm just showing up and because I know who to ask, I'm able to do it much more quickly than if you went on your own. That's sad. It shouldn't be that way. Right? I shouldn't be able to feed my children by making the system go faster for you because you can afford me and it not be fast enough for you because you can't. So what I would do is, um, I, I, I do know that one of the reasons it's so slow is they are, they are understaffed over at development services. They're very understaffed. And uh, so they have to pick and choose which projects to them are priorities. Uh, so they, need, they do need to increase that over there. Uh, as far as the process itself, though, there is this thing that we talked about earlier called code-based zoning. And we put code-based zoning into place on some parcels on the south side, very large parcels. Uh, and when we designed that, it worked. And it's just a color by numbers way of knowing exactly what you can put, what you can't put, and, what, you know, and how long it'll take to make those changes. It can be done. Other cities have figured this out. We figured it out in small Forces in the city. As far as traffic goes, Cynthia is absolutely right. That's the way it should be. Uh, you know, the third, a third, a third. <clears throat> and that's the way it is. We do that right now. <clears throat> what we don't do, and what we should do, is do um, achievement incentives, where if you finish it way earlier, you get paid even more than the contract price. Every time you do that, you'll be surprised. Those projects get finished very, very quickly. Thank you. Uh, Pat, did you want to? Um, yes, I want to mention that when I did the sun from my three buildings, I did it by myself because I like to save money. And that's why maybe it took me a little bit longer. But I wanted to check the process, and I have to say that I was successful. The first one was difficult, the second one was better, and the third one was a breeze. And yes, mine is right. If you know the people there and they know you, things are speed up, uh, they will be more. But that should be the, the, the reason why they, they take care of you as a customer. But uh, I went through the process and I think it can be done a lot better. Um, I heard on the contracts, um, I had 19 different places, um, on, you know, 12 years ago during the time of war, and five didn't provide the service. I can find And I think that's what we need to do, and I pretty much concur with Cynthia also, that that's what we need to proceed in construction. And also, the board also finish on time. 
I also want to make sure that there's some contracts because in many times the subcontractors that these large companies that are coming from up north, they subcontract corporations here, construction corporations here in San Antonio, and they don't pay them on time. And then you find yourself that they have not been paid, they stop working because they cannot buy material, they cannot hire people. So I would pay attention to subcontracting, especially in San Antonio, for these large companies that are the prime uh, contractors. There might be an issue there. 